We've just read Job 34, verses uh, uh, 20 and 21. I want to read Job 34 and verse 20 one more time. In a moment shall they die. The people shall be troubled at midnight and pass away. The mighty shall be taken away without hand. This weekend, we take time out of our busy lives to focus on Memorial Day. And we think through the folks that have given the ultimate sacrifice. Flags wave, parades are held, speeches are made and taps are played to remind us of the brave soldiers who willingly laid their lives down in order to preserve freedom that we hold dear. We think through the stories that we've heard from the veterans that we know, from the World War II veterans, from the Vietnam soldiers, and from folks who have returned from war in the Middle East. When we think through that, I think we are all moved at their tenacity, their grit, the love for country that they displayed in their darkest hours, in their midnight hours. As I was reading through for our Bible reading challenge, this phrase jumped out at me as Elihu is going on, and again, they're talking to Job and trying to tell Job where he's messed up, and one of the things they do is they go through and they talk about a lot of Bible truths. Sometimes they misunderstand some things, but there's a lot of things there, and a phrase jumped out. There's talking about people who are facing their end, who face trouble at midnight. And I started thinking, is there something in the Bible about midnight, about that dark hour? All throughout history, man has viewed midnight to be a time of fear, of uncertainty, of death, is a time when the normal pattern of sweet sleep can be disturbed with unexpected and unwelcome trouble. Job's friends are waxing ele eloquent about how God judges folks who deserve it. Job's well-meaning but ill-advised advisor in this passage uses that word picture, a very powerful word picture, about the terror that comes to those that are under God's mighty hand when they face trouble at midnight. I have a question for you right now. I want you to think about this as we start to meditate on this verse and on this concept. Are you facing a dark hour in your life? Are you facing that hour of uncertainty, like those soldiers we honor this weekend. A time of fear. Possibly a time of death. Brothers and sisters, I have good news based on God's word. No matter how dark the hour, no matter how desperate the situation, there's a couple of things that we know, especially as born-again believers. 
One, whatever you're going through or whatever you will go through, it's temporary. Amen? And if you're a believer, whatever you're going through, whatever you will go through, is going to get better. And if you're not a believer, whatever you're going through or will go through, it's going to get worse. And one last thing. Whatever your midnight that you face, whatever trouble at midnight that you face, whether it's something you're in the middle of now or something you're going to face in your near future, it is by God's perfect design, by God's loving hand and his providential plan for your good. Here's what we know. God uses the dark and foreboding hour of midnight to reach us when we need him the most and call us to take action in order to benefit from trouble at midnight. So what do we do? Well, the first thing that we probably ought to do when we think about trouble at midnight is we need to heed the warning of trouble at midnight. There are several different things. As I study through the Bible on the midnight hour and trouble at midnight, there are several purposes for this trouble at midnight. And one of the purposes is a warning. Hey, you're not where you should be, and you probably ought to change what you're doing, or it's going to get worse. Sometimes the trouble at midnight serves as a warning shot over the bow. God's saying, listen, listen, what you're doing is self-destructive. Please stop. We find this in Judges chapter 16, if you want to turn there. Judges chapter 16. And this is the story of Samson. Judges chapter 16, verses 1 through 3. Then Samson went to Gaza, saw there an harlot, went in unto her. And it was told the Gazites, saying, Samson is come hither. They compassed him, they lay in wait for him all night in the city, in the gate of the city, and they were quiet all night, saying, in the morning, when it is day, we shall kill him. Samson lay till midnight, and arose at midnight, and took the doors of the gate of the city in two posts, and went away with them, bar and all, put them upon his shoulders, and carried them to the top of the hill that is before Hebron. What do we know? Well, when Samson was called to be the deliverer, Samson, even before he was born, his parents were given instruction that he's going to be a Nazarite from birth. He's going to have some marks of distinction. He is mine. And I've set him apart to do some things. And we know he was not supposed to touch the grape or wine or anything like that. He was not supposed to touch a dead body. And he was not supposed to cut his hair. And of course we know that his job was to go deal with the Philistines. And not making a deal with the Philistines, but to go... Beat back the enemy. That's the whole purpose of his, of his call. But as we read the story of Samson, Samson kept surrendering his marks of distinction. Kill the lion. Where was the lion? In the vineyard. What are you doing there? 
goes back and has honey from the lion, dead lion. Why are you touching a dead lion? You're, you're, you're called as a deliverer. What are you doing? He surrendered two out of the three already. And then he goes and he's hanging out with, he's done a couple things. He already tried to marry a Philistine and, and that didn't turn out very well. And then he's hanging out and he's with a prostitute. Here he is, a man given by God, or given a, 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 a purpose by God, and here he is behaving like a heathen. Enemies, we got him. He's in with the prostitute. Let's lock the gates. We'll get him in the morning. Now, I don't know why, but he woke up at midnight. I believe God woke him up. Amen? I don't know this, but perhaps he woke up with a bad conscience. Oh, man, what did I do? And what am I doing here? You know what? I probably ought to go. Oh, no. The gates are locked. What do I do? I will pick up the door and the gate and the posts, put them on my back, and put them over here on the hill as I leave. Now, that's kind of cool. But you ever think of something else? God gave him that ability to leave. God gave him the ability to put those, um, that post up on the hill. God gave him the ability to see he was in trouble at midnight. Dude, what are you doing here? You don't belong here. If you don't change your ways, bad things are going to happen. So what did he do? He sets it up on the hill. And then a little bit later in the chapter, we see him messing around with this Delilah person. How did that go? Delilah, being a Philistine, wanted him to surrender that last piece of distinction. What a big surprise! Samson, you shouldn't be hanging out with a prostitute at midnight. Samson, what are you doing with Delilah? Oh, Delilah just wants to know this. Don't tell her the truth. See what she does. Okay. So he tells her a lie. She does the lie. And then he's the one made to feel guilty. Now, step one, you'd think, um, bonehead. She doesn't care for you. She's trying to trick you. You just told her how your strength would go away. She did it. Thank God you didn't tell her the, uh, the secret here. You are probably in a bad relationship. You probably ought to leave. One after another, after another, here is the warning. Try number one, try number two, try number three. <laughs> he spills his guts. She cuts his hair. And we know the rest of the story. He had no distinction left. He was weak like every other man. Why? Because when God providentially sent trouble at midnight to say, you need to stop what you're doing. He didn't. So perhaps you're going through a dark time. And it's not a random thing. Perhaps you're going through a dark time. Because You, uh, because you uh, need to change your ways.
The Bible says there is no temptation taking you but such is common to man. But God is faithful and not suffer you to be tempted above that which you are able, but will with the temptation make a way to escape that you or make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. That trouble at midnight comes to say, um, you need to go somewhere else. You need to quit hanging out here. You need to quit hanging out with the Philistines. It could be that your trouble at midnight is designed to get you to rethink your choices, to repent, and to go in a different direction. What else about trouble at midnight? Sometimes we're called to escape the trouble at midnight. Go to Exodus chapter 11, please. Exodus chapter 11. We read about that first Passover night. God's going to send a death angel. I want you to, uh, to look at what the Bible says in Exodus chapter 11 and verse 4. And Moses said, Thus saith the Lord, About midnight will I go out into the midst of Egypt. All the firstborn of the land of Egypt shall die, from the firstborn of Pharaoh that sitteth upon his throne, even to the firstborn of the maidservant that is behind the mill, and all the firstborn, or, or, and all the firstborn of beasts. There shall be a great cry throughout the land of Egypt, such as there was none like it, nor shall be any more. Firstborn of every household was condemned to die. Didn't matter race or background. This was not something that was just for the Egyptians this time. This was everybody. Every Egyptian household, a firstborn was going to die. Every servant's household, firstborn was going to die. Every Jewish household, the firstborn was going to die. That's just the way it was. There's only one way to escape it. And that was, as we know, to apply the innocent blood of the lamb to the doorpost. Flip over to Exodus chapter 12. In Exodus chapter 12, looking at verse 12, we see what the Bible says. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night and smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, against the gods of Egypt will I execute judgment. I am the Lord. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where you are. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. The plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. So, all the way back in the Old Testament, there's a symbolism that says, you know what, there's, a, there's an innocent lamb that's going to need to die. You're going to need to shed his blood. You need to apply the blood on the top and the sides of the doorpost. If you have applied the blood, you live. If you've not applied the blood, even if you killed the lamb, but you didn't apply the blood, you don't live. Even if you had good intentions, you don't live. Even if you're a Jew, you don't live. Only way you're going to live is if you apply the blood. Listen. There is coming a time when we're going to face judgment. It will either be after the undertaker or the upper taker. If you were to draw your last breath right now, you will immediately, your soul will be reckoned. Just like when the death angel come, came at midnight, the death angel came through, are you covered? Are you covered in the blood of the lamb? Blood on the, on the doorpost, you're covered. You live. We leave our, say, um, breathe our last breath. We're before God. By the way, St. Peter's off 
singing somewhere. He's not judging folks. Amen. And we stand before God, and he wants to know, are you covered in the blood? Have you come to that time in your life where you said, I know I'm a sinner. I know that sin's enough to send me to hell. I know that there's no good work, right, or ritual I can do to get to heaven. But I ask Jesus to save me from my sin because the Bible says he died for my sin. His blood paid for my sin. I am trusting in his blood. The Bible says that if you're if you've believed in Christ, you are covered in the blood. Guess what? That's good. I can escape that kind of trouble at midnight. The Bible talks about when Jesus comes back, he'll come like a thief in the night. He'll come like at the midnight hour, something that we uh, are not expecting. Matthew chapter 25 we read the parable, okay, Matthew chapter 25, we read the parable about the virgins that had to have their lamps trimmed to be ready to meet the Savior. At the midnight, there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. All the virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. The foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there not be enough for us and for you. But go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And when they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they, were, uh, they that were ready went with him into the marriage, but the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgin, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. They weren't ready. They weren't ready in the midnight hour when the bridegroom came. Hey, listen. Either we're going to draw our final breath and we'll be face to face with God and we need to be covered in the blood or Jesus come back and if you're covered in the blood, we're out of here. Amen? Jesus comes back, and we're not part of the judgment. We escaped the judgment because we are covered in the blood. But when Jesus comes back at that midnight hour, if we're not covered in the blood, if you've never trusted in Christ, then you will be judged. And that judgment will be great. And when Jesus comes back to shake mightily the earth, you'll be part of the folks being shaken. So it is wise to make sure that you're going to escape that trouble at midnight. There's another thing that happens. Go to Acts chapter 16 and verse 25. It may be that your midnight hour is designed to get you to sing praises. Now, sometimes the midnight comes to warn you you're somewhere you shouldn't be. We know we want to escape the midnight of judgment, but sometimes there's a midnight hour that is designed to show that grace will flow through you in spite of your circumstances. In Acts chapter 16 and verse 25, the Bible says, And at midnight Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. I want you to think about this. Here they are in jail. They've been beaten within an inch of their life. They are facing something they think might be their death. They're in pitch black filth. And they start singing. Maybe something like, My Jesus, I love thee. Now, 
all the rest of the folks are like, have you lost your mind? Verse 26, and suddenly there was a great earthquake, so the foundations of the prison were shaken. Immediately all the doors were open, and everyone's bands were loose. And the keeper of the prison awaking out of his sleep. Seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and he would have killed himself, supposing the prisoners had been fled. Oh, but I like this. Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm. We are all here. And he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas, brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And here it is. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. Paul and Silas sang praises during their hours, darkest hours of persecution. Every condemned and suffering soul heard that power of praise. And so when the earthquake came and the doors opened up, nobody left. Why? I got to see what's going to happen next. This is nuts. I'm not sure what's going on with these guys, but I think it's not that they lost their mind. It's that maybe they found something I'd like to get a hold of. It may be friends. It may be this. It may be God is bringing you to your midnight hour. Maybe not for deliverance, but for grace. So that you can hold steadfastly and publicly your faith in God, like Job did for a long time, like God told Satan Job would do. It may be your midnight hour has been designed from the foundation of the world to put you through this time to display the grace of God shining through your life right now. So you can sing at midnight. Now listen. I mean, singing anytime's good. But singing at midnight, that's a special kind of grace. He hath put a new song in my mouth. Even praise to our God, many shall see it in fear and shall trust in the Lord. The last thing we're going to talk about today is it may be you're brought to this point so that you can find hope in the midst of trouble at midnight. We'll not go through all these verses right now. But well, we can go to uh, Acts chapter 27. And we can read the story, verses uh, 14 through 27. We'll not read all those verses right now, but we know that um, in Acts chapter 27, they're in the middle of a shipwreck. Paul had given a warning, guys, don't go this way. Paul's on a prisoner ship. They had gotten to that point in Acts chapter 27 that all hope was lost. Paul sought the face of God. And God gave him hope. In verse 25, Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe God that it shall be even as it was told me. In verse um, 
21, after a long absence, Paul stood forth in the midst of them, Sirs, you should have hearkened to me. You should have not loosed from Crete to have gained uh, this harm and loss. But now I exhort you, be of good cheer, for there shall be no loss of any man's life among you. At midnight, the angel of God came saying, verse 24, Fear not, Paul, for thou must be brought before Caesar, and lo, God hath given thee all them that sail with thee. In the middle of the night, they all lost their hope, and they were pretty sure that it was done. But in the middle of the night, God gave special revelation to Paul, said, hang on, you're going to make it. I got more for you. It may be, friends, that the purpose of your midnight hour right now is so that God can come to you, whether it be in your reading of the Word, moving of the Holy Spirit, preaching, some other things, say, hang on, don't give up, don't quit, don't stop, I still got something for you. And I still got something for all those folks connected to you. And so God gives hope at midnight. You know, I read an interesting thing about midnight. It's been said that the world's best supply of perfume comes from roses on the Balkan Mountains. Have you heard this? Listen, this is kind of cool. The flowers from which the lovely fragrance, fragrance is distilled must be gathered the darkest part of the night. The laborers start right after 12 o'clock and they have to be done within two hours. The brevity of their work is based on the scientific tests that prove that during this gloomy interval, the most pleasing scent comes from the roses between midnight and two. Now tell me that God's creation isn't a great picture of God's grace. And what's one of the names for Jesus, the Rose of Sharon? Amen. Are you like the folks we remember on Memorial Day going through a dark time, a terrifying time, trouble at midnight? Didn't happen randomly. God has a purpose. Perhaps it's a warning. Perhaps it's a plea to make sure that you escape by the blood of Jesus. Perhaps you have a song to sing. Perhaps it is the light of hope that you're meant to see. Whatever the design, there's something you can learn from trouble at midnight. 